Welcome everyone. I see that we have a couple students who are starting to come in. Thanks for being early um, so we can get started right away. Um, we're super happy to have you tonight at our webinar on our newest major in the biology department. We're just gonna give everyone just about one to two more minutes to come in and then we will get started with this evening. I don't wanna repeat myself too much, um, but my, uh, you just wanna get one to get familiar with some of the features at the bottom of your screen. So you will see um, one of the main features is the Q&A feature, which just looks like two little speech bubbles. If you click on that, you are able to ask a question um, to um, our faculty members, and we will be sure to answer the questions at the end of the session. Um, if you don't wanna ask your question publicly for everyone to see, there is an option for you to ask it um, as an, uh, anonymously. You could also use your chat feature, just the regular chat feature to ask me a private question if you would like to as well. But we see, it looks like we have a good number of um, people joining us, which is great. Um, so I'm gonna get started. And then um, as everyone else comes in, um, they will just join us as well. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we are competing with some beautiful weather outside. Um, so we will make sure that we make this um, a very interactive and fun-filled evening. Um, my name is Danielle. As you know, I'm sure that you've seen all of my lovely emails, which you must have if you made it to this event tonight. Um, I am the undergraduate enrollment coordinator for the College of Science and Technology. So I am your go-to um, from now until if you decide to come to Temple until your first day of classes. So I am the person that you can always reach out to with any questions you might have and I can connect you with faculty, current students, um, anyone who can support you during this time. We are so excited that you're here tonight to learn about our newest major in the biology department, which is called Ecology, Evolution, and Biodiversity. We have two amazing faculty members here tonight that are going to be presenting um, all about this new major, research opportunities, ways you can get involved, and the potential careers that could come out of that. So, our two faculty members tonight are Dr. Eric Cordes, who is the vice chair of the biology department, and Dr. Amy Freestone, who is the um, program director of this new major. So I'm gonna pass things over to Dr. Cordes. And as I said, feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A feature, and we will get to those at the end of the session. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Danielle, and welcome everybody. Um, let me see if I can share this screen with you. Okay, now we're rolling. Um, thanks for coming. And uh, oops, no. Eric, we're looking on your email right now, so we might have to switch your screen. Oh, awesome! <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, thanks for hanging in there with us. Hopefully a few more people showed up in that pause. Um, so we're uh, Amy, Dr. Freestone and I are very excited to uh, share with you this new major um, that we have come up with in, in biology. And this is something that we've been developing for a couple of years now, mostly because of the strengths that we've acquired in the department and, and really the level of interest that we've seen in students starting to come into the to the university. Um, we're going to get to the expertise of the faculty shortly. We'll share some of the research that's going on in the department. Um, and we'll get to uh, some of the careers and, and other programs in the university that can help you get to those goals. Um, in the region, there really aren't very many programs in the area. Uh, UPenn has a concentration. Drexel has a concentration. Um, Pitt, if you want to go all the way out there, um, does have an ecology and evolution major and Rutgers, New Brunswick um, has a natural resources major. But this is a little bit different than that. And, and the way that this really touches on subjects across the university, we think is really unique about the experience that you could have here at Temple. Um, this is kind of the boring stuff. This isn't really significantly different from the biology major, which actually is a, a good thing. We designed this so that a lot of the 
the requirements are shared with biology. So you could transfer back and forth between the majors through the first couple of years. And that's true with a lot of the majors in CST. And, and we'll talk about a couple of those other majors as well. Um, that they're really, you know, the basic requirements are shared and, and they're really um, kind of interchangeable in the freshman, sophomore years is when you're going to start to see some differences. Um, the core is broken down into the ecology courses, uh, principles of ecology, and a writing intensive senior experience, which is very different than biology. This is going to be research in one of our labs, and you'll be working very closely with a faculty mentor to develop your writing skills and write a scientific paper um, or a proposal as, as you decide. Um, an evolution core, we think this is really central to all of biology, so genetics and evolution, um, which also fulfill requirements in the biology major are required. And then coming out of college with a good quantitative background is going to help you get into really any career. Um, these are really uh, some of the staples, um, but we've expanded this a little bit. So there are courses in a variety of departments that fill this um, probability and statistics for the life sciences is a course that math has developed recently. Um, remote sensing and GIS is a good quantitative skill to have. And that's EES is the earth and environmental science department in the college. Um, genome analytics, biostatistics, global change science, all of these have a decent amount of programming skills involved. Again, an incredibly marketable skill that's going to help you succeed no matter what you want to do. Um, and then in probably the junior year, possibly starting in your sophomore year, you can get into some of the upper level electives. Um, you would take at least one from each of these categories ecology, evolution, and biodiversity. Um, and there's just a wide variety of things that you can select from here, um, from marine ecology, animal behavior. Uh, I won't read them all, but um, biological impacts of climate change, evolutionary ecology, which is a really interesting class, genomics and infectious disease, which is pretty relevant right now. <laughs> um, population genetics, and then conservation biology, parasitology, herpetology, which is uh, lizards and other reptiles, um, microbiology, plants, all, all manner of different things in biodiversity. Um, and then we have really um, been in active conversations with other schools and colleges around the university. And you have plenty of electives in the later years, then you can take anything across the whole university. Um, EES, again, is Earth and Environmental Science down at the bottom and a bunch of biology classes, botany, which Amy's going to talk about more in a minute, um, and some interesting things over in anthropology. Uh, so lots of really interesting stuff. Um, the environmental science, uh, or sorry, environmental studies major, which is over in the geography and urban studies department is really interesting. And we interact with them a lot. There are a lot of good environment and society, environmental law, ethics, those kinds of things that are over there that are really useful if that's kind of your focus. Um, so a lot of really interesting things that you can get into in, in the later years. This is really just a, um, a general sketch of how your courses might lay out um, the stuff in blue or the major requirements. Again, that's pretty interchangeable with biology or um, environmental science, which is in the earth and environmental science department, um, or even genomic medicine, if you're into evolution and um, aspects of human disease even. Uh, and then you can see some of the requirements later on and, and some of the electives that you could take. If ecology was really what you're focused on, you'd take courses in climate change, uh, invertebrates, marine ecology. I keep saying that because it's one of the courses that I teach. Um, evolutionary ecology, tropical ecology, which is really cool. It includes a field trip to Belize in January. 
um, and snorkeling for 10 days down in Belize. I got to be a chaperone <laughs> on that course a couple of years ago. It was really a fantastic experience. Um, and we're, we're trying to develop more and more field work. Amy's going to talk about that some more, but we're um, working on some other arrangements with a marine lab and freshwater and, and trying to get you out into the field as, as much as possible. Um, so from more of an evolution perspective, uh, human evolution is a big focus for some of our professors. Um, there's a great expertise here, and so you can really dig into that uh, in a variety of different classes. Again, the infectious disease, molecular biology, those kinds of things um, also very applicable. And then biodiversity, um, invertebrate zoology, herpetology again, uh, microbiology, parasitology, animal behavior, plant taxonomy, botany, all sorts of different things, depending on what your favorite organism is. Um, you can work on them and, and spend a lot of time in the classroom with them. So uh, this is really one of the things that I'm most excited about. Um, Amy, Dr. Freestone and I are both in the Center for Biodiversity in the biology department. Um, which is a group of professors that I, we, we will both introduce you to in a minute. Um, the Center for Sustainable Communities, we've been interacting with a lot. Um, I'm on the steering committee over there. Uh, we're both on the, um, the uh, environmental science degree, which is, has some newly proposed concentrations in hydrology, um, ecology, climate, and environmental geochemistry, which is really interesting. Um, just lots of different people across the university that are doing really interesting things. And um, there's actually a certificate in sustainability that you can get while in this major. Um, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about that later on. Um, so here's the fun stuff. Here's all the different types of research in the college and mostly focused on the biology department in earth, uh, sorry, <laughs> ecology and evolution and biodiversity. Um, there's a competitive uh, research program that has, um, or a number of them, that uh, include funded opportunities. Um, this the undergraduate research program is in the college, science scholars program, the diamond scholars program is in the, at the university level. Um, science scholars, I believe would be, you would know, I, I believe by now, um, if you've been selected for that program, but the other ones you can get into while you're here. You can always, we have a variety of research courses that you can take, so you can um, get some of your credit and fulfill some of your electives just by doing research in a lab with one of the professors. And there are paid positions often in the summer where you can work in a lab um, for a salary for funding. So some of the Biodiversity projects um, that you can see. Uh, I work in the deep ocean and working on global biogeography, mostly of deep sea corals, but other organisms as well. Um, Blair Hedges recently described the world's smallest frog, uh, which is really cool in addition to his genomics work. Um, Jocelyn Bem uh, works on invasive species and islands. They looked at the um, diversification in lizards in the Caribbean, which is really cool. Um, Matt Helmus as well, and also works on um, networks of islands and how human ship traffic has transported species from one place to another. It's really interesting. Tonya Shea works on locomotion and studied the lizard that can run on water, if you ever heard of that. They called it the Jesus lizard. Um, she worked on that for a while and works on crabs and insects and uh, tarantulas. And she's always got crazy stuff in the lab. Um, Brent Sewell, uh, you'll see some of his work in a minute, but he does a lot of different population monitoring really all over, all over the world. Um, and this is the Center for Biodiversity that I already mentioned. Um, some really interesting stuff there and, and a seminar series as well in there that we get together and talk about papers or have invited speakers that come to talk with us. Um, spotted lanternfly, you've probably heard of. This is a hot topic in the, in the area over the last couple of years. 
Um, this is a collaboration between two of our professors, Dr. Ben and Dr. Halmes, uh, and Dr. Seibold, who's in the math department. And they're doing a lot of um, modeling using big data and applying um, their expertise to predict where this invasive species might end up next. Um, where the golden rain tree that they make their home on, that they feed on, where that might show up in our area. And then the spotted lanternfly is almost always right behind them. So um, they're trying to make some predictions and have a lot of funding from the state to figure out where this might go to, to potentially stop the spread um, and fight back against this invasive species. Uh, Dr. Brent Sewell works on white nose syndrome, which is also very prevalent in the Pennsylvania area. Uh, bats that live in caves and overwinter there can spread this disease to one another. Um, and it leads to uh, eventually entire colonies can be lost. And this is spread throughout the Eastern United States um, and is a serious problem. And he's been working on uh, lots of ways to study how this spreads and how we could potentially prevent it. Um, more general ecology, again, Jocelyn Bem, I talked about, uh, Dr. Freestone will introduce herself in a minute. Uh, Atsuhiro Muto uh, has recently been to Antarctica, um, and has been there actually a number of times. Uh, Sujith Ravi just got um, some more funding for a lot of uh, his work, and he works on um, renewables and renewable energy uh, and transitions to that over in the earth and environmental science. Um, Bob Sanders also travels to the Arctic and Antarctica and studies phytoplankton. He studies this really cool process called um, mixotrophy, where things that single celled organisms that you would normally think of as plants with chloroplasts and going through photosynthesis can switch to eating other organisms uh, when there's no light in the winter uh, in the North and South Poles, um, but they can also have the ability to feed on other organisms, but then keep their chloroplasts and use them when the light comes back. So it's really fascinating and is probably how some of the first um, cells that had organelles like chloroplasts and mitochondria, how they first evolved. So it's a it's really interesting from the point of view of like the origins of life and diversity of life on earth. Uh, and Rachel Spigler, um, Dr. Spigler's awesome. She does a lot of cool stuff um, and does a lot of plant pollinator interactions and is using um, some really advanced modeling and, and a lot of experiments to look at the interactions between um, lots of different pollinators, but a lot of bees and, and flowers and uh, in the natural environment. Um, these are just a couple of the different things that I work on deep sea coral ecosystems, um, exploring places on the ocean floor that no one has ever been to. A lot of times um, we're trying to get in there before humans go in there for economic reasons for fishing or offshore drilling. Um, I worked a lot on the, the deep water horizon, which you can see in the lower right there. We work on climate change and ocean acidification, um, places where natural oil and gas is seeping out of the seafloor. So lots of different things in, in the deep ocean. Um, and then our evolution group, I think our ecologists came in uh, first and been here a little longer, but the most recent and really exciting additions to the department have been in this area. Um, Ananias Escalante, who works on the evolution of malaria parasites in the tropics. Um, Blair Hedges, I mentioned already, but working in global systems. Jody Hay does a lot of uh, human evolution work. Isaac Clapper, who's in mathematics, has a lot of collaborations with biologists working on um, microbial communities and biofilms. Um, Rob Kalathanol works on sexual selection and evolution. Sidir Kumar runs our Institute for Genomics and Evolutionary Medicine, which is really a, a, a unique take on um, medical sciences and bringing evolution into the study and how diseases have evolved and if you can kind of go back in time, how we could potentially fight them. Uh, and Rachel, I 
Dr. Spigler, I mentioned before. Um, this is one of the big databases that uh, Dr. Hedges and Dr. Kumar work on together. Um, this is called the Time Tree of Life, and they have built um, this tree, this phylogenetic tree that shows you the relationships between all of the different organisms on the planet that have their genome sequenced. And it's given us a really different view of the history of life on Earth. And, and you can see on the bottom there are some of the correlations between how much oxygen is on Earth, how much carbon dioxide there is, the intensity of the sun, and how when these different events happen in the evolution of life on Earth. It's really fascinating, and I can't even do it justice for all the different cool things that have come out of this. Um, and then a lot of us work on really applied work in conservation and restoration. Um, and, you know, you can see these, but uh, we're, we're working in a lot of different areas to really make a, a direct difference and impact on um, how we treat our environment and how we can potentially bring it back after we've, we've caused impacts to it. Um, uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Freestone and let her show you some of the other cool opportunities we have. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, um, Dr. Cortez. If you could, um, I just requested, awesome, you just gave me control. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, before I launch into my slides, um, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background for why we made this major to begin with. I mean, I think it was because of students like you, students who had an interest in the environment, students who came into the program in biology and were interested in ecology, interested in nature, wanted to figure out a way of translating those interests into skills and a career. Um, and so we developed this for students like you. Um, so, you know what, we hope that you find this as exciting as, as we do, um, as we're, we're thrilled to be launching this new, this new program. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Cortez mentions um, a suite of different offerings at Temple now within the umbrella of the environment. Um, and this again is really addressing the student interest in the environment and in, in global challenges that the environment is facing. Um, and, you know, to, to differentiate between some of those programs, you know, we have the environmental science program, which is very much an interdisciplinary program. Um, and this EEB major is, is very much a biology based program. So that is one way to kind of think about those two majors and try to decide which one is best for you. So this is this is as a, is, is a um, integrating sort of our biology curriculum um, into the study of ecology, evolution and biodiversity. So um, as, as Dr. Cortez mentions, um, I'm an ecologist. I'm the program director of this major. Um, I'm also an associate professor in biology, uh, working with uh, Dr. Cortez there. I'm also the director of the Ambler Field Station, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But I wanted to tell you a, a, a little bit about the work that I do. Um, so I also study marine systems, although Dr. Cortez is way down at the bottom of the ocean, and I am not. I am on the coast. I'm in the near shore environment. So I'm just a couple meters um, down uh, into the, the coastal um, uh, oceans. But I study the invertebrates that grow there. Um, so you can see a couple of those pictures here, that kind of that colorful picture in the center. Those are all little animals that live in the ocean. And those are some of the critters that we study, to study the patterns of diversity that they have at different scales, um, going from everything from a local scale all the way up to the patterns of biodiversity that we see across the continental scale and differences between tropical environments versus the Arctic. Um, those are some of the topics that we are interested in in my lab and some of the ecology that underlies those patterns of biodiversity. I study invasive species as well as Dr. Cortez mentioned. So you can see that kind of globby picture in the, you can see my, um, my cursor there, but this globby picture in the upper left, um, those are also invasive invertebrates, just like you'd see spotted lantern flies if you kind of are walking through downtown Philadelphia. You know, invasive species occur in our oceans too, um, and they can come in and go gangbusters in the same way. Similar processes, very different environment, but some of those same theories we can study in different, under, uh, different environments to understand what um, makes an invasion successful or what makes it fail. So some of those dynamics are of interest. So we study um, predation. You can see a, I did a, a picture here of, of some fish predation that we're looking at. Fish consume those, those invertebrates. 
Um, and uh, we do a lot of large scale comparative studies as well as some local scale studies as well. And we've had students um, in our lab that have engaged in lots of different components of that work. There we go, oops, oh my goodness. There's a little delay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about the field station. Um, so we are, Temple now has a field station and this is very complementary to the EEB program. And if you're interested in pursuing um, environmental, um, other, other um, um, components of our offerings in the environment, like Dr. Cord has mentioned, the, um, this, our certificate in sustainability, all of these things are very complementary to the research and education platform that we provide at the field station. So um, what is the field station? We, we actually started last year in 2020. We were, we were designated as a field station by Temple. And you can think of a field station as an outdoor laboratory. For some classes, you might think you might go into the lab and do you know, work with a microscope or you know, uh, on a bench. But some work you can't do in a laboratory. Some work you have to be out in nature. If you're studying the natural systems, you have to study sometimes in the environments where all the complexities of nature occur. Um, and, and those are the kinds of studies that we can support uh, at the field station. And we, we support ecology evolution and biodiversity studies, as well as studies across a lot of other disciplines. So that's, that's the, the, the basis of the field station. Um, and as a field station, we're a resource to you. We're a resource to students at Temple, as well as our faculty, as well as students and, and researchers at other universities as well, and the public. Um, so some of our core areas within the research and education op educational opportunities that we offer, course ecology and environmental science is a big piece of what we do at the field station. A lot of other work that we have going out on out there uh, looks at global change science and solutions. And I've added a couple bullet points here to kind of give you a few examples of what falls, un falls under that fairly large umbrella. But we studied forest ecology, invasive species we've mentioned several times, um, sustainable food and energy systems. And as I mentioned, we have, we have a variety of other projects ongoing um, across other disciplines as well. So we have a lot of species over a biodiversity degree. We are, have a lot of biodiversity out of the field station. Of course, we're still learning about that now. Um, but just, you know, just in the, with the data that we have, we already know that we have over seven, excuse me, over 800 unique taxa out at the field station, including a whole lot of plants, birds and insects and a lot of these um, a lot of these assemblages a lot of these groups of species we're still we still need to catalog what, what we have at the field station so this is a, a growing list um, we also have a diversity of habitats so this is um, the ambler campus where the field station is uh, located so this is about a 50 minute um, bus ride from main campus. Um, and we do have a bus that runs between main campus and the field station. So you can, you can go up there, you can take classes up there, you can do research at the field station and still come back um, to main campus. But we're a 187 acre campus, and that includes five acres of designed gardens. We have several meadow environments, um, two ephemeral streams, and a couple little ponds, um, as well as over 75 acres of forest, including forests that are of different ages. So we have an older growth forest that's over 100 years old, and we have some younger forests that have have recovered since agricultural use in the past less than 50 years. So very, very different types of forests. Um, and so we can again use that to ask different questions for our research, as well as different training opportunities. And this, I wanted to spend a moment to talk about some of our forest work because a lot of our um, initiatives, both research and educational initiatives, are focused on the forest right now. This is a picture of our older growth forest at Ambler. Um, and as you, as you may know, I mean, a lot of our ecosystems, a lot of our natural environments across the world are facing unprecedented threats from a variety of global change factors, from, from invasive species we've talked about, from climate change, from land use change, and forests are no different. They're facing those same challenges too. They cover over a third of the, the terrestrial environments on earth, and they provide over 25% of the human population with food or income. So these are really important ecosystems that are facing a lot of challenges. And so we are launching a program at the field station to understand our forest environments more. And this is one that you can get involved with if you come to Temple. Um, trying to advance the slide. And it's not, oh, there we go. All right, now it's gonna shoot ahead several slides, but we'll hopefully we'll stay here. 
We're collaborating with the Smithsonian uh, Global Forest Earth Observatory um, to, it's called the Forest Geo, um, to uh, join their network. Um, this is a global network of over 72 sites across 27 countries where we all collect the same kind of data in the forest. And then we can compare it. You can compare the data that you collect at the field station in you know, Ambler, Pennsylvania with the same kind of forest in, in Europe, in Africa, in, in you know, um, Central Asia, wherever you, wherever there are other sites. So it's a really, really powerful tool. And so we are joining this network to collect these, um, these very detailed data um, on our forests to understand our forests. And we collect those data regularly through time. And then we can see how those forests change through time. And we're launching this now. We have, now it's going backwards, goodness gracious. Um, we have two different forest plots, um, an old, the older growth plot and a younger secondary forest at the field station that we're studying. And we're hosting internships, undergraduate internships every semester. This semester we're hosting five internships out of the field station for students who wanna get involved in this work, um, both to help us establish the, the um, what we call the Temple Forest Observatory, and also to do independent projects on things that are related to their own interests. So this is facilitating um, research, both for faculty as well as for students. Um, and it provides a, a platform for, for internships and training for, for some of you guys who wanna be able to get out in the field and have some training in, in field methods and species identifications. And here we go, okay. Um, so we also have, other than the internships, we have a field course that we're launching and we'll be launching other workshops. So even if you don't do a research internship out there, you could come out for a specific training event, either it's a one day workshop or a few days. So there'll be different opportunities that you can tap into if you were to come, uh, come to Temple. Um, and we are encouraging faculty on main campus to bring some of our classes out to, field, to the field station. So you might be able to come out to the field station even with one of your other classes. Um, and we also have citizen science opportunities. So even if you don't take a class at the field station and you just wanna come out and enjoy our trails um, on your own, you can use some of our citizen science platforms to help us collect data. And those data are really powerful for us to know what biota are at, are at the field station and for you to kind of participate um, in the process of discovery and of, of scientific data collection. And so we do have a trail system out there. I'll just make a little pitch. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful campus um, with, with the, the forests and the gardens and the trails. Um, and it's open dawn to dusk every day. So um, you can come out and enjoy it, um, both for some nature RX during the pandemic or for some, you know, an educational opportunity. Um, but it's a resource to you um, as, a, as a part of the temple community. So I think, yeah, with that, I'll say for the, for the field station, um, you, you can follow us on social media. Uh, we're on Twitter, Twitter and Instagram, and you can, you can get in touch with us. But this is one piece, one of many um, opportunities at Temple to study the environment. And I wanted to spend a moment to tell you about it, but this is in no way an exhaustive list. I think um, Dr. Cordes mentioned earlier, many of the other opportunities we have to engage in, in um, outreach and in education and in research in different facets of the environment. So there's a lot available to you if you're to come, uh, come to Temple. So I'm, I'm gonna give you your, um, you can have your 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 power back. Uh, <laughs> you can do whatever you need to do, Eric. But um, I think we'd be happy to um, take any questions from folks that may want to know more about something that we talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much. Um, this major is really really exciting, and 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 I think it's it's so prevalent right now um, to to protect the earth and to and to go into all these amazing different disciplines that you've talked about. I really enjoyed hearing about the research as well. Um, so yes, please enter your questions into the Q&A feature um, or into the chat feature. And I'd be happy to ask um, either of our faculty members. Um, I'm gonna start out with a question that was submitted just while we wait for some more questions to come through um, the Q&A in the chat. So um, someone wants to, or someone asked when we were um, registering for the event, what types of professional jobs would utilize this um, this degree or this major. So can you talk about some fields that students might be able to go into um, with this major or related majors? Do you want to start or do you want me to? <laughs> I, we may, I don't know, we may have different answers because there's a lot of uh, different possibilities here. Um, they, I, a lot of my students have gone on um, 
you know, first of all, we, we designed a lot of this for students to continue on to graduate school um, on a path towards uh, a higher degree, which can lead to um, staying in academia, to teaching, um, to doing research of your own, but also a lot of different uh, government jobs that you can get even with a bachelor's. Um, I have uh, former students that have that have come out of my lab that work for uh, NOAA um, to do um, any manner of different things with them. They do a lot of um, fisheries management and tracing populations and keeping track of populations and fisheries. Um, you can do uh, some of them work for the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, which actually does a lot of ecology um and uh lots of different places in noaa there's the bureau of ocean energy management which is a little lesser known but they hire uh right out of um college and bachelor's degrees um but there's there are a lot of local opportunities as well and and there are a lot of um parks that hire uh with bachelor's degrees right out of here um I don't know, Amy, if you have a... Yeah, that was a good list. Um, I would only add an, another one um, is non-governmental organizations, like conservation organizations. We've had students that have gone on to Conservation International. Clearly, they're, you know, some of the big um, World Wildlife Fund, these other kinds of large um, uh, international conservation organizations also look for this kind of expertise, um, both in, in the ecology and the taxonomy, but it's also, Dr. Cordes mentioned, the, the, the tools, the data science tools, the analytical tools that you need to be able to process those data. So whether you're doing it in a research setting um, or you're doing it for applied conservation, um, you often need those kinds of skill sets. We designed the curriculum with that in mind. Perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so one question that we did just get from Ryan um, is what major would you recommend for an incoming student that is interested in climate change or renewable energy? So um, kind of, I know you talked a little bit, Dr. Freestone, about the difference with environmental science and, and biology, but it, so if you could kind of gear this question to that, if they're thinking about the different majors we offer. Sure, yes. So um, I, would, I would ask the student who wrote that question, what part of climate change do you want to study? So, I mean, if you are interested in the biological aspects of climate change, then I think the EEB major would be a fantastic fit, right? I mean, so, so you understand um, the impacts of climate change on ecology, on the global biodiversity. Um, those, those kinds of questions would be spot on what you could study within the EEB major. If you're interested in approaching that from a more interdisciplinary perspective, um, and you want to learn about uh, some of the ecology, but also kind of the hydrology and maybe some political science and some economics pieces, then I would, I would encourage you to think about the environmental science degree, um, as I think that would be another, um, you can't go wrong. Um, it's just a matter of which one is going to suit your needs and your interests the best. And as Dr. Cardes mentioned, there is some flexibility right when you get here to, to sort of move around. We, we, you know, you're not at a decision point on day one. There's a lot of overlap in those recommend, in those requirements. So you can also, this takes a moment to think about what you want to do. And, and kudos to you for even think, saying, I'm interested in climate change. I'm interested in renewable energy. Like that's fantastic to have that level of direction. And as you think about it more, you get, you get into some classes, then you can start to sort of fine tune your selection. Um, but I would say, you know, re related to that question in particular, I would, I would say thinking about the aspects of the environmental challenges of, of most interest to you, and whether kind of an interdisciplinary approach or a more biological approach would be of interest to you. Did that, Eric, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, that's, a, I mean, that's absolutely right. I, I guess I would only add that um, when we were putting this together and, and Dr. Freestone and I worked a lot on this with a number of other professors in the department, but um, I'd say Dr. Freestone probably led this push. Um, but one of the things that we talked about a lot was making sure that students coming out of this major would have as many different kinds of opportunities as possible. And I think that's one of the real advantages of um, the college in general, 
uh, but a, and especially, you know, I'm going to sell this major, but um, but that the, it's not you're not limited coming out of this in what you could potentially do. This could lead from everything. Um, and I can't believe I forgot the non the NGOs work uh, because that's really near and dear to my heart. But um, you can go right out and go into, you know, an advocacy group. You can go into, um, I have friends who then went on and got law degrees who out of, even out of this major and finding someone in, in government and law that's um, a, a manager of resources that makes decisions, that sets policy, that understands science and understands the importance of that. Um, is really valuable and and when i find those kinds of people in my professional life it's it's really it's refreshing and and i really just love to work with them and so um i don't think you're you're limited in any way and and not to you know downplay other majors but i think you can get too focused too early in in um in some areas and i think that this is gonna this major will really set you up with the, the quantitative skills that we really wanted to emphasize. Um, geographic information systems can be used anywhere now. And just, you know, coming out with the programming, with the understanding of the, the just the scientific method and, and the way that things work, um, and some of the really key tools that, that we've tried to build into the program, I think would set you up for really any number of different futures. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we got another question that I was anticipating getting, which is great. Um, but someone was asking, you know, I've already declared my major, but now I like this major. So can I can I swap majors? Which of course I'm sure uh, Dr. Cordes and Dr. Friesen are very happy to hear. So yes, of course. So this major was not on the application when you applied this year because it was just recently approved. Um, but you can absolutely switch into this major. I would encourage you to um, wait until you, if you decide to come to Temple, to come to your orientation this summer and your advisor can help you switch majors because regardless of the major that you're in within CST, you all go to the same advising orientation and, and you can change there. So that is very awesome. And, and we'll be happy that we'll be happy to take you in. Um, yeah, Paul, and I, I think I'd mentioned it. I, I, I mentioned it when I was going through the curriculum, but that was another thing that we really paid attention to that, you know, all the classes you take in freshman year in CST will feed into almost any of the majors. And so um, you really do have some flexibility built into the program. Yeah, and I, I would also just add, um, as Danielle mentioned, your, your faculty advisors. We also have a faculty advisor for EEB, that's Dr. Sewell, who we've mentioned a couple times, who does work on white nose syndrome um, and a variety of other things. Um, and so he will be the faculty advisor for this major. So you can also have your, your college level um, academic advising, but also someone specific to this major um, that can help sort of guide you through um, any of these kind of decision points. He also works on conservation in Madagascar, which is really just awesome. <laughs> um, it's amazing. I, and Dr. Freestone has worked in Panama and all up and down the, the West Coast and, and the East Coast. Um, I mean, I work all over the place, Bob's in Antarctica and the Arctic. I mean, we're really the, the researchers in the department are everywhere in the world. Yeah, that was going to be one of my next questions. I want to answer this one first and then I'll ask my question. Um, but someone just, uh, Br Brenna asked, is this only an undergrad major is available to graduate students as well? Um, do you know of graduate programs that we have in these areas? <laughs> so I'll just give a, a, a quick quick answer and, and then Eric, you can jump in. Um, but I would say I was, I was thrilled to see that question because I think we are very much looking um, to develop some graduate level um, opportunities. Um, so it, hearing some in inquiries about that is very exciting. Um, I will say right now, we don't have an EEB graduate degree available. Um, that being said, you know, we offer graduate degrees in biology. Um, and really when you're, when you're pursuing a, a master's and when you're pursuing a, a PhD, um, it matters a little less what the degree says and a whole lot more about the research that you do and the work that you do through that process. And so you can certainly pursue graduate study 
um, in the department and have it be focused in ecology, evolution, and biodiversity, even if your piece of paper at the end said biology. Um, so it doesn't limit you in that respect, but we are very excited about the opportunity of expanding graduate opportunities for sure. Eric, did you want to add anything? Well, I would just, uh, just two things. The, um, we have worked very hard to make our graduate program as flexible as possible. We're at a very interdisciplinary and, and diverse department um, in terms of our research interests. And, you know, I, my PhD is in biology, if that helps. Um, you know, it doesn't really, like Amy said, it's uh, any, it's really more about the person that you're working with in the lab that you're in. Um, but we do have lots of graduate courses um, in this area, and some of the electives that we mentioned are cross-listed, so there are graduate students in those classes. Um, so even as an undergrad, you'll be interacting with the grad students and, and learning right alongside them and in the same ways that they learn. And then the graduate courses get more independent as you go along. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, you know, the the title and the degree doesn't mean as much as the the signature of the advisor on your thesis. Great. So this is actually an interesting question. And if the two of you don't know the answer to this, then we will have to uh, get back to you on it. But someone asked, would this major apply or qualify under the uh, any of the accelerated degree programs at CST? So I'm um, guessing that they mean for our PSMs, our professional science master's programs, and some of our masters, you're, you uh, have the opportunity to do a five-year program, which you can earn your bachelor's and either your PSM or your master's in five years. Um, do you know if EEB will be able to do these programs? I know right now um, it's biology primarily, but you know, you're within the same department, so one can only hope. <laughs> Yeah, I believe you. Uh, I mean, it will it will feed right into there. Um, I haven't, you know, that is. I don't actually know formally if we need to do anything to make that uh, a possibility. But um, I will just say yes that uh, <laughs> if if there's some little like administrative hurdle we have to jump through to make that happen we will but i don't think there is i don't think there are any restrictions on on those kinds of programs i think pretty much yeah. any major will feed into it it's more about how well the programs align and this aligns very well with a number of our um, professional science masters including the one in bioinformatics mm -hmm. um, and so kind of big data science uh, and a few other ones and potentially some more that may be on the way. It's something that um, Dr. Freestone and I have been in discussions with uh, some of the other schools and colleges that were on the list that I showed you about truly interdisciplinary programs that cross colleges and schools and um, the, the potential for having a PSM in, in sustainability that would, that would be almost university-wide is something that um, we're thinking about and, and may, do, may be developed soon. Yeah, I think, so that, stay I think, tuned. I think that's a safe answer too, but, but we can definitely follow up on it as well. Um, so all of our students, please make sure that you answer any final questions you have as we're coming to the end of um, our time here. But thank you for the questions you've submitted so far. This has been a great conversation. So just make sure you ask any final ones now. So I kind of have a two part question that ties into two things you've already talked about. But one, um, we focused a lot on research in this presentation, but I don't think that we um, we kind of expressed why research is so important and why this might be, you know, a big advantage. Of course, Temple is a research institution, an R1 research institution. So clearly we have faculty members who are dedicated to research, but being a high school student, you might not kind of understand why this is a great advantage. So if you could explain, you know, why research is so important and then as Dr. Cordes kind of teased, you both have been to such amazing places to do field research. So if you could talk about why research is important and then a little bit about where you've gone with your research, that would be great. Do you wanna go first? Uh, sure, that's that's a biggie. Um, so, so research, getting involved in research, um, I would say there's two, two 
reasons for that. One is it complements your academic training. So in, in, in classes, you're taught, here's the textbook, here's the knowledge, here's how nature works, right? And then you get to the research side and you're like, wait a minute, people are still figuring this out, right? We're, you know, knowledge is growing um, with expanded research, right? And so to be part, to understand that can help you put your academics in perspective and um, can help you on get a deeper understanding of, of your coursework. Um, I will say also just being part of that discovery of that creativity of generating that knowledge is exciting, whether you want to do research as a career or not. Um, it's a wonderful thing to, to at least try out to have be part of your training and to be at a, at a research university, you can do that. I mean, you have opportunities coming to Temple that you won't have at a lot of other smaller schools that don't have the expansive research enterprise that Temple has. And so I think we can offer a whole lot of opportunities that will really enrich your experience, um, you know, if, if you are going into research or even if you're not. Um, but, but ex, you know, experiencing that um, you know, I always tell my students, you know, research is, it's creative, it's exciting, um, it's not a, a dry textbook, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of living and breathing that, that scientific process. Um, and, um, and so I would encourage you if you have an opportunity, um, wherever you go to school to, to dip your toe in and, and try it. Um, to, to answer the question about, you know, where I've gone with my research. Yeah, just, just like Dr. Cortez, man, that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, you know, I think both of us, our research has taken us all over the world. Um, I love what I do. I love being an ecologist. I love doing research. I love having a question and being able to pursue an answer to that question. That is, that is an exciting process for me. Um, I have gone, as, as, as Dr. Cortez mentioned, I've, I've worked with Dr. Sul in Madagascar. I do a lot of work in Central America. We have comparative studies going across the Americas. I do a lot of travel, not in the last year, but a lot of travel in general um, for, for my work. Um, I love the experience of, of looking at, you know, be experiencing new environments and understanding the ecology of very different places on earth. Um, that is, it, it, it satisfies an intellectual curiosity um, and, and it's, it's just, you know, a, a wonderful job. Like they pay me to learn things about nature. Right. Um, and you, you can't beat that, um, in my perspective. So that, that's Dr. my pitch. Dr. Uh, Friso, not to interrupt, but I just have to know, like, as someone who doesn't have a science background, um, what brings you to say, I mean, I want to study that in Madagascar, or I want to study that, like, wh why Madagascar? Why those certain areas? Yeah, um, so it's it's generally driven by their question, right? I mean, that comes down to the scientific process and trying to figure out what is your question, right? And that in, it, that is, is its own process, right? Kind of trying to, to funnel down what you're refining, what your, your question is. But some questions, you know, they can only be answered in certain areas of the world. Um, and sometimes it's about a very applied reason. You know, um, for example, you know, we've done work on, on conservation in the Comoros Islands um, in, you know, in the Western Indian Ocean and you know some things like that you know you can only answer that question there that is a very site-based specific research program for that area like Dr. Cardez I'm sure you could jump in here I mean there's only certain places that you can study the deep sea um, and certain areas that are of interest to you so maybe I'll I'll pass the baton to you to talk, talk a little bit about your work well it's the largest habitat on earth so you can go any almost anywhere um no, I'm just kidding uh it is the largest habitat on earth um, one of the most, actually, one of the applied questions is what took me to really my favorite trip so far. Um, and I went to the Phoenix Islands protected area, which is out in the Central Pacific in a country called Kiribati. Um, and it took us six days south, uh, sailing south from Hawaii to get there. Um, and there are no permanent residents on any of the islands. And we went there because it is it at the time it was established, it's the world's largest marine protected area and the world's largest UNESCO natural heritage site. And it was created because there are coral reefs that are some of the most remote on Earth and the most removed from human influence on Earth. And so they're still in pristine condition, which is really amazing now. Um, but the vast majority of the area that they were protecting was in the deep ocean and no one had ever explored it before and so we were the first ones to go and to see what was down there and it turns out that 
on these islands, which are essentially giant mountains like the Himalayas rising from the seafloor, um, that there are corals all the way down the sides of them, not just fringing the top of them. So it was really exciting and really interesting and just some amazing people. Um, and just to, you know, to be able to bring in those kinds of resources and, and um, share our knowledge and our expertise with the, the people that live there and help to train them and show them what, what they owned really. And that's, you know, this, this is yours and, and we're just showing you what it is. It was really an amazing experience. Um, the only, just very quick, the only other thing I would add to the um, why do research question is that um, uh, hands-on experience is the only way to really figure out if that's what you want to do with your life. If you want to know if this kind of thing is for you, go try it. Get into a research lab, get your hands dirty, you know, get out in the field, see what it's all about. Because we can explain what kinds of careers there are and, and jobs and the types of research that goes on. But until you actually do it and, and you get in there and, and uh, you know, have to think on your feet and figure stuff out and answer questions that you didn't even know existed, um, that's when you figure out whether this is for you or not. And, and this, <laughs> there are a lot of different things that fit into this. So, you know, in my lab, I, I've had students rotate through different projects and decide that one aspect is much, you know, the genetics is much more interesting than feeding corals in an aquarium, for example. Um, and even, you know, I know Dr. Freestone has a lot of different things that she does in, in her lab and her research group. And you can, you know, try out, have a bunch of different experiences in one lab. And then if that doesn't work out for you, you can go to another lab and, you know, and, and we can help guide that and, and help advise. And, and Dr. Sewell is a wonderful advisor. Um, and uh, actually, in fact, he won awards for it. Um, and uh, we can, you know, help find the right fit for you and figure out, help you figure out what it is that you want to do with your life. Great. Well, thank you both. It looks like we just have one final question and then we'll wrap up. But um, one student wants to know, um, I know the, Am the Ambler station was mentioned earlier, would this major require students to be on the Ambler campus opposed to Maine to choose this major or is the station just a specific benefit of attending the Ambler campus? So no, you, um, you can be a student on the main campus. And then as Dr. Freestone mentioned, we do have um, a bus that runs back and forth between the campuses. And it's just about a 40 to 50 minute, depending on who your bus driver is, uh, drive to get out there. Um, so yes, you don't have to specific, you don't have to choose one campus over the other to use the benefits of the field station. Is there yeah. anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, just the, the, the yeah, and I pre, I saw this question and I'm glad we're, we're getting a moment to answer because I do want to clarify. So the major is based on main campus. So you can use the field station as a, a, a supplementary experience. You can do research, research out there. We, we will have courses taught, you know, taught out there, but you do not have to go out there. That is not a requirement of the major at all. Most of your classes would be focused on main campus. Perfect. All right. Well, that just about wraps us up for tonight. Um, I want to thank Dr. Cortez and Dr. Freestone for the amazing insight. Um, you're making me wish I could go back in time and pick this as my major um, and, and work in the lab with you and do some research. We're really excited to be able to offer this to all of you. Um, to the students, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for your questions. Um, we're so happy that you're interested in this major, of course. Um, and then to the students watching at home, um, please be sure to um, ask any questions that might come up. You can always email me. My email is just D as in my first name and then London. Uh, so D London at template.edu. And I'd be happy to connect you with Dr. Cortez or Dr. Freestone with your questions. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, and if this kind of uh, helped you decide the temple would be the place for you, you can always make your deposit on your TU portal and commit to being a temple owl. So everyone have a great night and thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Bye everyone. Hope to see you in the fall. <laughs>